you need to start a long way from Algeria to find people who can speak freely about the war between the generals who run the country and the armed Islamic groups who oppose them. In London, you'll find Mohamed Labri Zatout, an exiled Algerian diplomat who says he defected when he discovered the cynical manipulation of the Islamic uprising that's cost thousands of lives. Most of them are infiltrated. That means that the Algerian society is under huge manipulation because uh, those who are supposed to fight against the regime are in fact just another wing, just another uh, uh, hand of the regime. Why would the government infiltrate the armed Islamic forces and then allow the violence to go on? To justify the use of violence, to uh, uh, manage the Algerian society as they would like, to uh, take as they, uh, as they want and as they could f uh, from the uh, oil and gas money, more than $12 billion a year, and to call for the support for the West and to stay in power, in fact. The images of anguish in Algeria are all too stark. The reasons for the conflict, all too murky. They've built whole graveyards for villages decimated by brutal nighttime slaughters of whole families. Men, women, children, babies. My son, who was 13, died like this. Before he died, he cried out, God is great. They either shot him or slit his throat. They're amongst the thousands caught up in violence they simply do not understand. It's not the way it should be, nor the way it has to be. Algeria has a lot going for it. Nature has been generous. There is fertile soil, and along the Mediterranean coast, abundant fish stocks. And riches beneath the Sahara Desert in the south that make it one of the world's largest exporters of oil and gas. But history has not been so kind. It is full of violence. The Romans left their indelible mark, but plenty of conquerors followed them. Amongst them, the Vandals, the Byzantines, the Arabs who converted the country to Islam, then the Spanish, the Ottomans, lastly, the French. <laughs> to many people in regions like Bumades, east of the capital, that have been hard hit by the violence, the government's claim that the war is a clear-cut case of a civilized society fighting against Islamic extremes rings true. It rings true to Huria, whose husband, a local mayor, was assassinated by Islamists. Linda's husband was a policeman. The two women now see their role as one of helping to rebuild community morale undermined by the conflict through events like today's teenage fashion show Muslim style that Islamic extremes would find abhorrent. For Huria, it's a way of fighting back against the Islamists, but it's a bittersweet event held in a hall named after her assassinated husband. In the Bumades region, hardly a town or village remains untouched. 
the two women travel to them almost daily. This forest was a refuge for terrorists and they used it to get into the village of Corso to launch their attacks. Maria and Linda have started an organization that tries to help some 800 families who've lost members to the conflict. In the town of Corso, 23 people have been killed so far. The town hall bombed three times. <laughs> this is Drifa. Her husband was a mason, a man of no politics. But forced to choose between one side or another, Drifa's husband joined a self-defense group. And one night, he was shot dead in front of his 11 children. You still have hypertension. Has the council done anything about your pension? No, not yet. My husband left hardly anything when he died. Even on the day he died, there was hardly any food for dinner. Do you understand why your husband was killed? No, I didn't understand. I didn't understand why they killed him. Linda, at least, has no doubt about why her husband died and who was responsible. He was killed in the course of his duty. I feel I'll never get rid of the hatred I have inside me. Ask me to forgive a terrorist, I'll never do it. It's out of the question. No, nobody knows why people die, why civilians are being killed by Islamists, why a policeman, why a councillor is killed, ordinary citizens. Nobody knows why. <laughs> The result is a fracturing society, mistrust and guns spreading through communities. The government set up vigilante groups called Patriots and handed out tens of thousands of weapons to those considered loyal. Yet the nature of the war and Algeria's terrain make security from attack anything but certain as the mayor of Corso shows us. Many militant Islamists are said to be well-versed in guerrilla warfare, men who fought with the Mujahideen in Afghanistan against Russian occupation and returned to pursue a new jihad, a holy war, here in Algeria. There's the foxhole. After a few days' surveillance, the Patriot forces found this hiding place. And the hardware and bombs they found in it were ready for use. A mere two kilometers from Corso, an arms cache once provided a handy point from which to launch nighttime raids. And there are probably thousands such hideaways around the country. This is a 200-litre barrel, which they used as an entrance, and they'd hide it later with branches, so that's why it's very difficult to find. This is the side of the conflict we're supposed to see, and surrounded as we constantly are by security men who eavesdrop on every word, few dare challenge the government line of a battle between good and evil. Yet back in Drifa's house, a local teacher gingerly risks hinting, but just hinting, at another side to the story, about corruption and about who benefits from this war. Some people, yes, maybe they have some, I know, their business or their uh, seats, politics seats, they, they enjoy this life because they are, not, they are out of our life. But you do think that some people, as you say, almost enjoy this life. At least, perhaps, they make money out of it. They make a good, new good way of life, yeah? <laughs> what I can see, I and everyone, and like you, maybe you are, uh, you, you have I mean, a vision more than me, better than me, because you look from outside. Yeah. 
you can begin to explore the other side of the conflict in the capital, Algiers. Here, there's a large westernized middle class whose way of life feels most threatened by the Islamic movement and by the armed insurgency. Perhaps we have to come to private clubs that are secure, guarded and watched over, but relatively speaking, we can live a normal life. I live normally. I go out during the day, I play sport. But you have to watch out, obviously, and take precautions. This is the face of a modern, stable, secular Algeria that the generals say they're protecting. And because of this, many in the westernized classes simply turn a blind eye to the regime's financial corruption and increasing political repression. Beyond the walls of the private clubs are the people who are supposed to be threatening Algerian stability. Poor people. Like the so-called wall lemurs, jobless young men in a country becoming increasingly impoverished because billions of dollars in oil profits have been squandered or raked off into private pockets. Yet those who might question or protest or even show Islamic tendencies, risk imprisonment, torture and death in the name of national stability. Yes, I am Salima Ghazali. She's one of those who dares to speak her mind, but she's condemned as unpatriotic for exposing the other side of the conflict, the way the government takes ah, advantage yes. of the violence. Yes, uh, yes. A writer and human rights advocate, her reputation perhaps gives her some protection from arrest. She's won a raft of international awards for her work. But Salima Ghazali despairs at the way other countries, interested only in protecting trade and oil supplies, have cozied up to an increasingly repressive regime. Tell me about this one up here. Yes. Well, this one, I think it's the bad conscience of the European... <laughs> do you the bad conscience? People. Yes, I think they had the bad conscience, because Europe can do a lot for the Algerian people, mm. and they do not. They prefer uh, the economical interests in the gas and the, mm. in the oil. Salima says the regime uses the fear of violence from both sides uh, to silence the legitimate voice of popular protest. No, the, of course, they are taken between two fires. Mm. You are afraid from people who come and kill all your family. But uh, they are also afraid from the repression, from the army, the security service, especially the young people in the street. They know how their neighbors have been taken by the security forces. A lot of them disappeared. A lot of them uh, have been found killed. For three years, his mother is looking for his son. There are at she least 2,000 unsolved cases of missing people. Pawns, according to human rights lawyers like Mustafa Bushashi, of a regime that refuses all peace efforts and is determined to hold on to power at whatever cost. They are frightened for democracy, or that democracy does frighten them because it's a way to lose power. This, uh, this is make me think, you know, uh, that this violence suits a lot of people. People who want to gain economically, financially, and the people who want to stay in power. The war is real enough. But from the suspicion that the battle against the GIA, the Islamic insurgents, suits the government's purpose, it's only a short step to the darker claim that part of the GIA is now infiltrated and manipulated to ensure the conflict continues. I couldn't work for government which is killing uh, its people. Uh, just to stay uh, for just for the generals to stay in power, uh, uh, members of the uh, former members of the GIA said, "In fact, we have been infiltrated," and I think uh, 
the manipulation, the infiltration of the Islamic groups, uh, it's for the regime, it's a necessity, but for the Algerian society, it's a, a catastrophe. We were fine here. My kids used to play with the neighbors. We were happy. Now, all these people are dead. Amidst the ruins of her shattered life is Fethiye Yolef, the woman I first met mourning at the graves of her husband and three sons. They're not here, they're buried in the cemetery. They're all there, this one, that one, this one. All dead. No one will come back, they're all dead. On one night in just six hours, more than 200 adults and children were massacred by Islamic attackers in Bentalha. The nearby military barracks did not intervene. What the extremes on both sides have done is unforgivable. But the most benign view is that the government cannot, will not end the suffering. And the deep suspicion is that it doesn't want to. Now only international pressure to stop the fighting and start the talking can end the agony of these people. But it had better come soon. I can see the shadows of my children coming to me. Sometimes when I'm asleep, I can hear my sons calling, Mummy, Mummy, but I can't find them, just their voices calling me.